right. And we are sort of live. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to the Iron Lords Podcast, LLC, and also on lordsofgaming.net. Episode number 292, the bonus episode. And it's another glorious Monday. We were back at the round table of the Lord's Day. I'm extremely excited about our special guest. And we've got Tango Games Work and the massive success of Hi-Fi Rush. So we go get right into it. I want to introduce a lord whose dream project of rhythm-based action gameplay, synergized with an exceptional visual art style, has literally transformed Chai and 808 from wannabe rock stars to two of the coolest future mascots of Xbox. Introducing the game designer at Tango Gameworks, a game director on the iconic Evil Within 2 and the Hi-Fi Rush franchise. The lord of feel-good vibes who keeps us rocking to the beat. Still a beast on Guitar Hero Live, whose studio is responsible for the best shadow drop of 2023. Live from the land of the rising sun, by way of New York, we found out, <laughs> and kind enough to make his debut into the realm of the Lords. My man, Lord John Johannes of Tango Gamesworks. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> good right. to have you good to have you a lord at what you do man it's only right we show you the proper respect in the round table so um first of all have you got a chance to play anything through all this craziness uh i've been actually playing my game now <laughs> to make sure it's <laughs> working on my xbox <laughs> uh yeah other than that um i've actually just been watching streams of people playing the game mm -hmm. uh rather than me playing anything new myself so since it's come out i haven't played anything yet no doubt, no doubt. Have you been soaking it in? Is it? Is it just? It's still. You're still in the whirlwind of it all. Yeah, I'm chasing people, like trying to find every last secret, as well as like people who are getting stuck on stuff. I'm actually like, I'm like a a game counselor, like reaching out on on Twitter and trying to like be like, hey, you should try this. You should try this. <laughs> no, no. Salute to you. Put it in at a, at a extra work. Their due diligence, you know, post development. Yeah. No, I do, no, yeah. No doubt, no doubt. And of course, we have the four horsemen of gaming here in the realm, the original lords of the realm, and the round table. Salute to Saul, he could not make it, but he sends his questions and his love. So we got my co-host, Nicole Most, my brother from another mother, the difficult game conqueror, lord of his own world, and the how of the young wolf, lord addict of the addict show. How are we doing, sir? Doing pretty good. You know, I didn't really play much of anything yesterday. I ended up uh, bench watching all of the Lord of the Rings somehow. I don't know how that happened. I don't know why I started the first one, but I started the first one. Mm -hmm. And then before I know it, I was ending the third one. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I definitely appreciate you guys coming on here. It's, it's definitely an interview that I, I've been looking forward to. No doubt. And of course, returning, we have the Incredible Hulk of this, a.k.a. the Excess Gamer. Ooh. The Prophet of Xbox. Swami. King of the Statues. Demands nothing less than that premium experience. It is the leader of the Fraud Alert Movement. Ooh. <laughs> Beloved Lord King. How we doing, sir? Hope you feel a bit. I'm doing extra fantastic with an extra little bit of sleep. Nice. No, I did not pass away, people. <laughs> no, I was not on Said my your love. Uh, no, but... um. I've been having a good time. Actually, uh, caught up on a lot of games that I had on the back burner and a shadow drop game that I didn't know that I had to play mm -hmm. as much as I wanted to play it. Once I saw it, I knew I had to download it. So uh, we all know what that is. That's High Five Rush. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we talked about it enough, but now we bring you the man, the myth, the legend, and we're going to get into this game. I am super excited for this right here. No so, doubt. No let's doubt. get to it. And of course, we have the gaming ninja himself, the Shinobi, Lord Cognito, spreading that realness in the realm of the ILP, not telling you what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. Again, nothing but high fire rush, man. Ended it. And uh, yeah, we got a lot to talk about today. So we're going to get into it, man. So now that we kind of got the intros out the way, you know, we got to focus on um, Lord John Johannes, man. His video game system history, his journey into game development at the legendary Tango Gameworks. And of course, what led him to writing and directing one of the brightest surprise hits of the Xbox and the Bethesda developer direct. So Lord John, let's start from the beginning. What was coming to some of the first video game systems you had and what got you into gaming? 
Oh, man. Uh, so I actually grew up in one of those homes where you're not supposed to play video games. Oh, I know about those homes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same. Um, so I'd go to other people's houses and play games. But um, I think the, the first system that I actually was able to have was the Super Nintendo. Um, and then from there, uh, I just kind of found, you know, or was able to get my hands on any system afterwards. And I wasn't, you know, a like I wasn't a Nintendo person or like a, a Sega person. I was like, and anything would go as long as it was fun. Um, yeah. So I would basically be playing pretty much everything. And then when I went to university, maybe I like, you know, dropped off a little bit, but then I came back afterwards. <laughs> what, what brought you back? What brought you back? If you remember, I don't know. I'm trying to think, uh, in a weird way. So I, Throughout university, I, I kind of just like focused on studying and stuff. Um, but then afterwards, I moved to Japan. And one of the first games I played when I came back, when I went to Japan, was uh, Persona 4. Go uh, yeah, which is weird because I was living in the countryside. And if you know that game, it takes place in like a countryside town. So yeah. I got super into that. And then I was just like, that's what, that was after... I played that when the PS3 was already out. So then I'm like, you know what? Let me get PS3. And then, you know, I just kind of went from there and nice. got spiraled out of control again. Yeah. So. <laughs> King, any questions before we move on to gaming? No, 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 no. Um, I was going to ask him about his rhythm based video game history uh, in there because, uh, first time I got a chance to see Guitar Hero or, or Dance Dance Revolution was in arcades. And being that you're in the land of the rising sun, and I know that's huge over there. Was that your first experience into the, uh, you know, the beat genre, or was it a home console that got you in? Like you was over somebody's house and you saw it and was like, "Oh, let me get into that." I think the first rhythm game I ever played was Parappa the Rapper. Oh, <laughs> me too. Me too. Yeah. Shout out to so Parappa the Rapper. I, 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 like, I don't even think it was, maybe it was possible before that, but I think, you know, with the PlayStation and like the, the audio systems that they had, I think that yeah. was the first time you can kind of pull that off. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that game so much. Uh, and it had a unique art style. Yeah, again, yeah. That's the type of thing that like, you know, we can get into it later, but when you think about that kind of era where it's like, they just wanted to try something cool mm -hmm. that was fun and play around with something that looked cool as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it wasn't a really long game. It was like six songs only, but it like, it's something that I can say now and, and all of us go, yeah, like we remember that yeah. one, right? Oh, yeah. So Stick around. Oh yeah, yeah. No, definitely, definitely. I had a good game here. Some questions for uh, Lord John? <clears throat> uh, no, not really. Well, mm -hmm. you know, you pretty much ask. I was going to ask the rhythm question and King beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's what King likes doing is beating me to questions. Right? But, <laughs> no doubt. No. So look, we, we go on because I know we can talk gaming for a long time. You know what I mean? We definitely want to respect your time. But uh, we got we to gotta discuss like that unique journey because, you know, I looked at, you know, your history, Lord John, and what seems very unique to me is like how, you know, on one hand, like you transform from this like language teacher to then go to Japan to, to teach English and then become a game developer. Like this is like mind blowing to me. So like kind of walk us through like that journey as far as getting into game development. Uh, yeah. So my path is not a traditional one. I don't think, uh, <laughs> I basically just applied for something on a website with no experience whatsoever. <laughs> Woo! It, was, it was, yeah, it was one of those things. It was, um, you know, I was in Japan already. I was doing something called the JET program, which uh, people familiar with Japan or in general maybe know it, but it's an opportunity to go to the to Japan and teach in schools and help with their English language programs. Um, but they normally send you to parts outside of the city. Like you don't go to central Tokyo and do it. You do kind of in the, in the countryside. Mm -hmm. um, so I was there and it was a great experience in general, but also there was not a lot to do, especially if you're in the countryside. Mm -hmm. um, so I just spent a lot of time just studying Japanese. And when I was kind of finishing that up, I was looking, thinking what I was going to do next. I thought I might want to go to graduate school and study Japanese literature or something I did in college and wanted to get into it. But I found this, uh, you know, obviously I said I got, kind of got back into games during this period. Um, I found this basically blog post saying, hey, the the founder of Resident or the creator of Resident Evil is making a new studio in Tokyo. And there was like a link to the website, looked at the website. And 
I'm looking at all the positions there with no intention to actually apply to anything. Cause I'm just like, okay, <laughs> let me see what this is. And the only things that say that they're looking for is like people who want to make games, people who like games, people who have passion for games. So I'm like, yes. yeah, but like, no, you know, it's very specific. Uh, you know, you need to have like four to five years experience with this engine or something like that. And I was like, all right, you know, what? like, let me write a cover letter because, uh, you know, at the, you know, the creative Resident Evil, my boss, Shinji Mikami, you know, not just Re yeah, not just Resident Evil, but like, Weirdly enough for me, I was super into at that point uh, Ace Attorney, which he didn't he didn't make he produced, but like the you know the sort of he's known for kind of like making very well made games as well as sort of producing these interesting ideas. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what, let me give it a try, and I kind of just sent like my resume and a cover letter and be like, I have no game experience, I don't know what you're doing, but I want to help. <laughs> make something especially for like a like a global audience as well so it doesn't feel like you know it was we're kind of getting to that era where japanese games were like struggling on the ps3 yeah. mm -hmm. um they're feeling very japanese and maybe international markets weren't, go weren't going for them and i was like you know i w i just want to be there maybe early on to help out and you know provide insight and stuff like that they called me in for an interview we just wow. talked about games and I was offered a spot on the team, which is at that point, 20 people max, you know, okay. it's a new studio and people were doing like multiple jobs. And I sort of just like wormed my way into the game development conversations. And so I was, we're all sitting together, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, uh, and then there became a point. It's like, well, do you want to be on the game design team? And I was like, yeah. And, you know, and that's how it kind of just started. Wow. Um, and then it was just basically learning as going. So I didn't have any training or mm -hmm. or anything like that. So wow, that that Attic, that's, that's just madness. <laughs> <laughs> like, Attic, what do you think about this, man? Jumping on the team like that. How, how do you feel about that? Hearing that story from John? Yeah, I, I guess it's definitely not the norm. Uh, I don't know too many scenarios that that's happened, but mm -hmm. you know, especially being you know in Japan, you know, really going up to a studio like that and you said you you know you definitely w was a gamer at that time but at that time I, I assume you wasn't playing a whole whole lot at that time because you was doing the, the, your studies and stuff uh so it, it's definitely i would say when it comes to you know applying that what, what, what kind of like what kind of anxiety did you have going into something you ain't never done before uh well for like like for the job interview or something, I wasn't anxious because I was like, I didn't really expect to get it. He shot his shot. I, you gotta respect yeah, the shot, true. bro. Yeah. Yes. He, he, goes like, in, he doesn't expect to get it. Like, yeah, yeah, you got the job, you're like, who, me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, basically, I went in there with the thing of like, bet, best scenario here is I get to say I worked in a in a game company for like six months nice. <laughs> before they put it. Yup, throw that right <laughs> on the resume. Throw that right yeah, on the yeah. resume. You good? <laughs> we can build. Want to ask me what that was? Yeah. Um, but then when I was in there, I would, you know, I think like it was like pretty much every day. I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. So like, I'm gonna get fired tomorrow. I'm probably gonna get fired tomorrow. So you like every day for the first yeah six months. But um, but yeah, like it, it, you know, in a weird way, when you get into the game industry, you realize that there's not really a a, a science per se to how to make a game um a lot of it's like discussion and thinking of what's fun what works so when i kind of realized that i realized okay it's, it's okay to like make mistakes and try stuff and pitch stuff and it's not going to go well and uh and never get too attached to certain things as well but mm -hmm. Yeah, first couple of days definitely anxiety inducing. Then it kind of calmed down. If that makes sense. No, that's what's <laughs> up, man. I, I love I love to hear it, man. That, that's a very inspiring story. Shoot your shot, and then obviously you're at Tango. You're working with the legendary Mikami. And um, so my understanding, you go, you go from evil. You start like kind of like evil within DLCs, that kind of thing, and then to where we are now, which is kind of like this 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 magic thing that's happened. So I want to start with like the pitch of Hi Fi Rush because it's be honest it's such a, it's a really departure from tango kind of culture wise you know what i'm saying like you got this rhythm based game you got all this you know throwback feel almost dreamcast like energy king like it, it's yeah. it's like i, I want to go through that pitch process first and then like any other game inspirations because again i'm feeling 
feeling some Sega vibes. I'm feeling a little Xeno gears. I'm getting a little crash. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting Futurama. I'm getting all this stuff in it. So like the pitch, the inspirations, like walk us through that. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the pitch goes to where the, basically where the inspiration was, where for a long time, I just had this idea of like, you know, when you see a trailer or a movie or, uh, especially music videos, especially like in the late nineties and stuff like that, when they had like the budget to do it, they would coordinate everything to the music Mm -hmm. and it would just feel really good and really tight, you know? And I never felt like we got that experience yet with like an action game. Mm -hmm. Um, And in my mind, it was just like, man, it would be cool if we can make a game where everything syncs to a music track. But this was like way, way back, probably I would almost say like 10 years before I even pitched it Mm. internally because the idea is cool, but I was like, how can you actually pull it off? And after we finished The Evil Within 2, um, we knew that the next game and that we were going to production was Ghostwire Tokyo. And so we had these kind of like dark games. Another one that's coming up that may not be a horror game per se, but it was kind of still in that sort of moody, dark, moody atmosphere. And um, at that point, I kind of had, I'm always, I would always come back to this idea and I said, okay, this is like a 180 from whatever we're doing, but when we know what's coming up, if we're going to work on something now, if we're going to try to do a, a turn like this or do something interesting now, it's like now's the chance to do it. So if the same thing is like shoot your shot, it's like <laughs> I'll, I'll do it now and try to pitch it. So mm. I pitched it basically how it is in the game. It's mm. it's very bizarre for like a pitch to like work out its way into the final product, but <laughs> uh, yeah, because game development like you, it doesn't work. You just redo it a, a bunch of times, but um, yeah, it was just like okay, this is a game where it's a rhythm action game where every hit and every punch like hits to the music and it just feels like you're part of a music video. Mm-hmm. And the basic plot was there. It's like, you're someone who's, uh, gets this like robotic arm replacement, like a music player falls in their chest. You team <laughs> up with a bunch of allies and take down the boss of this, this tech company, like one boss at a time that was all in there. Um, and the same thing with the colorful style. Oh, yeah. Like I'm like, I used things from the PS2 era and the Dreamcast era and yes. and said, you know, remember when the times where games were just like colorful and fun looking? Mm. It's like, this is a game that doesn't take itself seriously. It's going to be over the top. You're going to look at it and you're going to say it's fun. It has these like over the top characters. Mm-hmm. And again, this is all in the, is all in the pitch. And when I was explaining it, um, I, you know, the first thing I did when I put that on the table was like, this is, probably not going to get past this table because right. this is the most un-Bethesda thing you can ever imagine um, us doing. And, and, but I just kept going into it. I just like, I kind of almost like physically explained it to, mm-hmm. I was like, you know how like every punch and every, and I was like physically doing it. Mm-hmm. And then by the end, it was clear that there was like a very strong passion behind mm-hmm. this idea that my boss kind of saw as like, this seems like a very tricky thing to pull off, but obviously you have like a good concept you you have in your mind. So let's see where this can go. Mm. Um, that question, that question, I got a question. Uh, since you said your mind, right? When you closed your eyes, did the game look in your head mm. like how it looks now? Oh, good question. Uh, the visual, the visual identity yes. wasn't there, but I knew it was going to have this like blue skies, like colorful look like it had to. Like, right. like there, there was no way I could pull off like a ry- rhythm fighting game with music player in the chest with like realistic characters. <laughs> right. like Definitely so, yeah. not. Yeah. But, Let's go for the high graphical yeah. for the <laughs> yeah. realistic fidelity on that. I, I but you wanted you. To, to be departed away from that anyway. You wanted to carve out your own like like identity. And th- mm-hmm. because this game is so, like you said, like such a departure from what they've been doing and your pitch sound probably so super refreshing because I'm, I'm pretty sure when, he, when, when they hired you, they saw some type of passion, right? And it just all accumulated to this one point in this pitch meeting, the, the reason why you're there. Right, because you, you know you said, "Hey, six months, I'm out of here." But no, <laughs> we get past the six month part, and you're here with with this pitch. And because a lot of times when we draw, I used to draw as a child, and I give it to my friend, say so he can bring it to life, and it looked like 
how I wanted it to look. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to know, did the artist really capture the character? Because you got a, like a Peter Parker type of character. You said Queens. Mm -hmm. And it, he Ooh. feels really Queenish. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's like he has this Queen swag. So when you said you're from Queens, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you got <a> Peter Parker. <laughs> I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if the, the, like I said, the visual identity, like Shy would look like this, or at that point, they didn't even have a name, but right. it's just like, you, you knew that it kind of had to have this like silly, like spirit to it. Yes. Yes. And that's what I knew that we need to have is not just from a personal perspective, but almost from like a, a company perspective yes. um, from our studio, you know, the studio is founded not just to make horror games mm -hmm. um, and Mikami's always been vocal about that like you know Ooh. it's about breeding new ideas and and if it's interesting if it's worth making we should make it um so this kind of maybe was also like a chance for people in the studio to get to like stretch their legs and and try something new as well and not get like pigeonholed into the yeah. same like yeah. loop over and over again um and it was the same way with the the art design it was like we had artists that were for literally like 10 years working on you know like like blood scrape walls and stuff like that and like rusty corridors <laughs> and to ask them to be like hey okay we're gonna go everything's gonna be super colorful um there could have been a lot of like pent up like energy in there from like not being able to do that for a while <laughs> it's like thank just, god yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. um but yeah i think there was a little bit of that but also i think it was just a fun challenge to see like how far can we take this and and go with it and we didn't want to make it feel like anything else too we wanted to kind of put our spin on whatever we we're going to do so it wasn't just like a copy paste thing that we wanted to do so yeah, yeah. attic real just... quick question when you take this newer type of game to uh developers that you know have been working on games like the evil within for for a good amount of time and you bring up like this newer concept and, you know this newer art style were they did it sit, uh was they ex extremely excited to work on something new like that uh definitely some people were mm -hmm. and some people maybe weren't at first you had to like convince them mm -hmm. uh because it's like a departure from both genres like it's not a rhythm game per se mm -hmm. and it's not right. like a straight action game per se right. so when you go to somebody who's like i've worked on action game before um it's you can't you can't combine these two elements it's gonna it's gonna conflict with each other and i'm like no 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 you, we can do this we can do this um but then some people were like really into it like the the sound team was into it and, and figuring out different ways how to, how to make it work mm -hmm. they said the art team was into it um i think there was some maybe uh worry from for example like um some of the art team like the environments and the characters like can they pull it off like mm -hmm. When you're doing animation and stuff in, in a real type game, you usually do motion capture and you capture all the motion. Right. But in this game, we had to do everything by hand mm. um, to have it have that cartoon feel. Like you can't capture yes. that. So mm. um, again, a huge departure is almost like kind of like relearning, but it was good, I think, for practicing like actual skill. Like you instead of just kind of copying from, you know, real examples, which when you make a real game, you pull from resources, you pull kind of like match you right. know if it's an environment you pull from like a, an actual building sample or something like that here it's like okay we need to design everything so like really kind of push your creative energy in that sense no respect um you mentioned before about you know the studio and i know we talked about influences and stuff like that i, I gotta ask a second question but my brother saw wanted to know you know were there any other you know what's your pedigree with any with these sega stuff and maybe particularly dreamcast generation were any other members of the team you know, also have residents with that, that have familiarity that maybe worked, worked on stuff like that, that they can pull from to help out with Hot Fire Rush. Yeah, so a lot of the people, especially in the core group of people who made the game, were all in the same age range. So we kind of had that same inspiration area to draw from. And we would talk about things, you know, if it was like the Dreamcast, like talking about, I remember like that feeling of when you saw Jet Set Radio for the first time yes. or, you know, and, you felt like, oh wow, this is this is finally like cool, and they're they're really like pushing like the medium, um, as opposed to like a realistic style, just something that looked really cool. Mm -hmm. And so that was, for, for example, like in our perspective. But for example, on our team, while we did do the initial prototyping and have all like the action game stuff worked out, eventually we had people join who did work in on action games. Like for example, our lead designer, uh, a guy called Yamata-san, he worked on. Uh, the original Devil May Cry, even mm. like he's like an classic, 
like the OG of like oh, action yeah. game stuff. Oh, and yeah. and that was where like you had that initial sort of maybe pushback of like, I don't think this can work because all the action games I work with, like you, you couldn't restrict movement like this. And, mm -hmm. but I was like, no, just, we, we got to go with this because that's, what's going to make us like different than the other games. Mm, um, the push the push. So, okay. yeah. So, you, you know, it could have been easy just to like fall back and be like, yeah, you know, you're right. It's, it's, you know, let's just make it like a normal action game. But nope. um, I think if you have that really strong vision, you kind of have to like hold your ground and like mm -hmm. really see it to the end. And if, if in the end it doesn't work out, then you can, you come back and do it. But, you know, always try to see what you want to do until like you get to that, that point where, you realize like, okay, this is as far as I can take it. No, but um, respect, respect. I got a, I got a, a, a secret nugget question. That's I'm the conspiracy theorist, right? So, <laughs> yes. oh my God. all right. So, <laughs> all right. So don't get the interview canceled. Come on. Oh, no, no. <laughs> so, not even that. I used to be, I used to be uh, a manager and a producer of, of hip hop artists, mm -hmm. right? In you say the late eighties, early nineties, that's late in the eighties, early nineties, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, we used the Roland um, TR-808 composer beat machine. Mm -hmm. Now, I saw the cat, the cat yeah. name is 808. And am I reaching, <laughs> thinking that there might be some hip hop, something maybe one day? Oh, you wait for the <laughs> you, know, you know, listen, um, oh, no, because when, when I saw it, I was like, I said, oh, Yes, man. We used to use the 808 drums. Oh my God! <laughs> and I'm like, uh, it, what? What's your history with the compose? Do you do you know about the synthesizer? The yes. Yeah, I I, I, I do know. That. I mean, that's where that's that is where the name came from. Um, <laughs> because it's just to me like that existed before the, that character or something existed before we made it as a cat. Even it was just like. Right. We needed something for the player to look at over the shoulder that can keep the beat. And we're like, nice. okay, this is a metronome. This is something that's keeping the beat. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, what's more iconic of like a beat than, than the, the, than the, the, the way. <laughs> so, yes. so that's where we kind of went with. No um, doubt. No doubt. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can, it, it, the sound effects that the cat makes is, you know, also, yeah. uh, taking it from there as well. So, yeah. uh, yeah, there was some inspiration there, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of funny because we went into like a, for a rock angle, uh, right. for this project. So it was tricky to like get the, the 808 to like match with <laughs> yes. the this is, this is what I was saying. I was like, yeah, yeah. I said, I don't know how he did it. I don't, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out because there's other things that I have to another question later after these other guys ask questions, right? <laughs> My other lords. But um, that one was sticking with me and I was like, he's making it work because I'm I'm listening to the, to the soundtrack and I'm so happy that you have a streamer soundtrack and you have the other soundtrack, very important, right? Right, in this day and age but i'm like he's making it actually work because something that you think can't fit and it does fit and it fits perfectly yeah no absolutely and and i wanted to to kind of follow up with what you said in reference to just making hi-fi rush and to me one of the aspects of that like it, the game being on beat and everything kind of like linking it, even the environments is you know pulsating to the beat the whole even you know chai himself snapping his fingers the whole mm -hmm. bit you know what honestly made me try it because Attica could tell you like we are not the rhythm game guys like let's go be brutally honest with you Lord. like we we generally don't gravitate towards those because the mindset is generally when you play them you know if you fail you don't advance right yeah. so it, it's usually very oppressive but one of the things that constantly made me try it was that the the being on beat set seemed for the most part additive to the experience you know like a bonus to the experience you know what i'm saying as opposed to this super punishing requirement from stage one and even stage one i felt was like a great tutorial like just getting into it learning it and then i remember getting to the boss fight and i was like oh no i, I think they got one with this this is this is not overrated this is not people just buying into the to the art style and everything like that so i guess the question was for you for you was the the conscious design to not penalize as hard for, for people like me, myself, who are terrible at, at, at rhythm games. And then two, kind of alluded to what King said, which is about everything being dependent on the BPM, everything being de dependent, the art style dependent, you know, the transitions from 2D to, you know, the cutscenes, the animation dependent on this beat. Like what, what were those technical challenges to, to get everything aligned with that as well? 
Okay. Those are two like massively big Sorry. questions. So I'll, go, <laughs> I'll, I'll go in order because they're kind of related. But okay. um, so the the initial concept right from the beginning was this accessibility of of the game. Um, so like I said, also in the pitch document that the idea is that I wanted everything to sync up automatically to the rhythm because, uh, I knew that most people in, even if they have a rhythm sense, unless they're playing to like a UI, you know, like a rhythm game and you, we were talking about like, you know, prep or, or dance sense revolution, you're basically like just trying to match up things to the UI, mm -hmm. but we didn't want to make it feel like you're doing that. We want to make it feel like you're in control of the game. So in order to make it feel good, we knew that we needed to kind of sync up everything on the back end. So no matter when you press the button, it's going to give make you give you a positive impact, uh, basically where the the punch will hit on the beat or something like that. Mm. And then I, then we said early on it was like okay let's you know the, the the general like game design is like what you said like if you don't press it on the right time you'll fail. There's like a fail yeah. state, right? Mm -hmm. And but the worst thing that you could do as an action game is just press a button and nothing happens. It feels yeah. like it's like a mistake or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we switched gears into making everything be this sort of like positive gameplay loop where it's like, you don't need to worry about playing on rhythm because we'll do that for you. And anytime you need to, or you need to, or we, we want you to play on rhythm, we'll give you some visual aid to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, we want to give you basically bonuses for doing that. So we're encouraging you to do that. So. <laughs> The even if you mess up on like the first input on like a combo or something, if mm -hmm. every hit lands on the beat, all you need to do is just when the next hit hits the character enemy, just press the button again. Mm -hmm. So we're giving you like lots of ways to sort of even if you mess up somewhere to kind of jump back on it and grab on again. Mm -hmm. And that went that was like our whole philosophy throughout the game. And so we tried to be as lean as possible because we knew that you know like you, you even said like maybe if rhythm games aren't your thing. You'd, if it looked like a rhythm game to you, you might have immediately kind of like turned away. Yeah. But it looks more like an action game. We don't yes. have those UI on the screen and things like that. Yes. Um, so that was really important. But then we then this kind of goes to your next question is, is when everything's moving to the beat, it's like, how can we make the player feel, even if they're not using UI, that they're kind of subconsciously in this zone where they can feel where the beat is? Mm -hmm. Because that's when we want them to press the button. So we kind of went all out because we realized through testing that some people just, their eyes go to different places. They feel different things. Mm -hmm. Like that's why we have the UI bouncing to the beat. We have things in the environment bouncing mm -hmm. the beat. We have, we do have assists and we have the 808 over your shoulder mm -hmm. to help you. Um, and we realized that some people thought 808 was super helpful. Some people didn't even notice it at all, but some people <laughs> were looking at the UI. Yeah. Some people saw the environment as the thing that helped them. So we knew like it had to basically be we have to make everything go with yeah. the beat. Um, and that I think is what makes the package too, by making it feel like it's not just this small aspect of the game. It's like the whole package of this, this, this world that you're playing in is this, you're in this zone essentially. Like, um, I don't know if any of you play music, um, but if you, if you, <laughs> if you do or, or, or you are like super into it when you're like, really into the music you almost get into this sort of like trance type state where you're like really feeling the beat mm. um and that's what we're kind of hoping for people who, who really jump in jump in and you know use all the mechanics and and see what all the enemies are doing and how the world is moving that you get into that sort of trance like zone oh. where it just feels like you're like i said like you're you're playing a part in like the music video that's being like almost edited around you oh no I, I absolutely I, i'll tell you what i felt that way. well during the uh was it the roquer boss fight mm -hmm. Roquefort? Yeah. yeah oh <laughs> that fight literally i'm zoning i'm i'm parrying I, i'm i'm it, the beats hitting the wolf gang thing is hitting and first of all, the character design of the boss fight is absolutely beautiful. Somebody like uh, Scrooge McDuck in that building. Some one of y'all <laughs> like Scrooge McDuck, because I know what y'all did with that part. With the goal. I said, oh, this fight is for me. <laughs> and it, I'm just, so, and the beat's hitting, and I'm, it, it's a zone. And it, I, can't, it can't, I, I can't explain playing music, but playing your game made me, feel like, made me feel like I was a conductor of something. Like I was really so that He couldn't touch me at one point. And I really wanted to thank y'all for that because that encounter was awesome. But I, wanted, I know I'm asking a ton of questions. But Attic, I, got, I, got, I got a question. We got to get Attic, though. Then we got you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. What, what I do like, it, well, it's not even a question. It's a statement. Mm -hmm. What I do like 
and it's very subtle. Mm-hmm. When you get a consecutive hits and you get on that streak, Ooh. and you start to see uh, the UI flashing, the sound raises, mm-hmm. and you get more in tune to the beat, and it, it just encourages you more. Like, and, and I, I found myself every time I'm playing trying to get the music rising and it just mm-hmm. seems like the world just starts to come more alive as the more you become on fire so yeah. i was just uh collecting all my like you know every time i finish a board take a picture snapshot to show how many <laughs> <that> i got <laughs> I, yeah. first, first thing i want to do is give you props to you know really hyper focusing around the player experience in this i feel like that's the difference between yes. a lot of people making this game and you making this game with you and your team is you know, because you hyper focused around the player playing it, it was more enjoyable for the player while they were playing it. So it led to the success of the game. And another question I have, real quick, that I was just thinking is uh, obviously there's uh, you know, assist characters in here. They pop in when you press buttons. They have certain gameplay mechanic loops on them. Uh, was that always the intentions, or did you originally have them on the map with you, and then you figured out maybe it'd be easier to do the hologram way? Yes. Yeah, so. The assist characters early on, we we did prototype switching them out like a different weapon. Like you'd actually Ooh. literally switch the character and they'd have like different rhythms that you can attack to. But this is something again that we learned really on is that you, you know, when you add in these super deep features early, mm-hmm. you can kind of like blurry your vision, mm-hmm. which was difficult because most people couldn't handle switching to a different character and then adjusting their rhythm sense. Mm-hmm. For example, like let's say if you have the Peppermint character mm-hmm. and she's gonna shoot her gun on like eighth notes, so you need to like kind of like press them very quickly. We realized that people couldn't quickly switch up from just a, a, a quarter note like mm-hmm. beat to then go to an eighth note beat. Mm-hmm. And it just wasn't fun. Um, so then we backed off and said, the best thing that we can do is kind of make this as simple as and easy as possible for you to just summon a character they'll do their thing they'll help you out and they'll add like their layer to it and Mm -hmm. and that's a more enjoyable experience Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah that's a great that's a great point because yeah i can see how that could get like really (laughs) confusing again for people people like me who you know struggle with that kind of stuff so yeah i thought the the interaction was kind of seamless i wanted to transition from um kind of like obviously you talked about game development you talked about you know i'm assuming like what four or five years but um Obviously, during this period, you know, you guys are acquired, or at least Bethesda slash Zenimax is acquired by Microsoft. So I guess the question I have for you is like, you know, during that during that time period, I'm assuming no platform was decided just yet. But like what influence, if any, did Xbox have as far as maybe approving something or saying, hey, good job or, you know, where you guys are at during the development process? So interesting enough, like you said, we were, this game was way into development before we were acquired by uh, Microsoft, but we were still in that sort of period figuring out, you know, what were, what was our platform? It was just running on a PC. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, when we were acquired by Microsoft, it was like, okay, well, our platform decided that's, (laughs) that's 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 that that makes sense. Yeah, that was easier um, than you think. but in a weird way, uh, you know, I think the the process, and I'm not involved with like the higher up discussion, but you know, because or I, Xbox has been pretty vocal about have they been relatively hands off in the game development process and really leaving it up to the studios. Mm-hmm. So for us at our studio, we're we were basically business as always with how we worked with our team in Bethesda. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're just going back and forth with them, and. In the, the weird thing about how we also decided to release this game, you know, in sort of like a, a shadow job, as everyone's calling it. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, I'm sure that there are probably people at Microsoft who didn't even know that the game existed before that point. So, <laughs> I, you know, I don't I don't know, because we kind of kept it internal for a long time. And mm-hmm. maybe part of the, it was because of the secrecy of it. Yeah. But um, yeah, like I said, the experience with the Microsoft, the, you know, they didn't they didn't come in demand anything or or request anything we just wanted to make it run as good as we can on on their platforms and support their ecosystem you know with like game pass and things like that you know, to get it, you so, have a question follow up real question question um you know obviously this was a shadow dropped you know that's not really a practice that's done a lot in this industry 
Uh, but what I want to ask you is like, what were some of the precautions you guys took to make sure that this didn't get out of the studio <laughs> and like people it. found <laughs> out and leaked it? Oh, yeah, you know how that go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, honestly, you know, maybe until the very, the last like couple months before launch, like we didn't do anything special. I mean, you know, anyone who works on the game, like I said, I think I tweeted this out, but you know, everyone was like super professional about it. You know, normally you get people that go out and they, they immediately talk about what project they're working on. I think, uh, you know, they, everyone was very respectful and, and just didn't talk about the game. We never came down hard. It was like, you cannot speak about this game to anyone. Um, <laughs> they just knew it, it, they just knew it wasn't announced. So we're not going to talk about it yet. Um, and then as we got closer to release or that the point we were going to drop it, I think we took a little bit, more precaution, you know, especially when making assets, who we're giving them to. And, you know, we wanted to keep that secret because that was like the the cool key point about our release. Um, and that's where I think we kind of looked at, okay, let's make sure we're getting the right people in this meeting or something like that. But before that, I was surprised that, you know, there were a lot of people working on this game. You can look at the credits. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and yeah, a lot of people again very respectful on the job that they're doing so they they just helped out and and didn't say anything so. no, I, I got, I got a question yeah, no, please, hold on hold on because okay. no please it, this is this is a good one mm -hmm. uh, okay no i noticed while playing the game the in-game graphics or animations are running probably at 60 frames per second right and then when you go to the like um what is it's not full motion but when you go to the you can't control the cut scene it go, it cuts into like the spider-man into the spider -verse. Uh, spidey verse mm -hmm. uh type of animation and i know that was like thought of on purpose or so was it a, a manga style anime style or a, you know a current cartoon style that you were going for as keeping it making everyone understand that this is a cartoon world and and leaning heavily into the cartoon genre was yeah, that, that, that was definitely part of it. Yeah. Uh, early on, we knew that we we're going to try to emulate this sort of uh, 2D animation style within right. a 3D world. And we tried, it's called animating on twos. It's like every yes. other frame is animated. Yeah. Um, and we did that for the cutscenes because we tried doing it in game to see yeah. if we can get the characters like lo looking like they're moving like that. But yeah. it was just, again, the player experience was not good. It made it look, feel like it's, the animation was not smooth, especially like for an action game. Yeah. yeah. So that's where we made the conscious decision to sort of cut it. Uh, you know, when you go into what we call cutscene or something like that, we yeah. um we would we would drop it the frame rate of the animation. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, that all all needs to be calculated, you know, so it needed to happen. There needs to be like a transition so you wouldn't get be too jarring to see yeah. that so it's like a wipe or something like that or the camera would pan quick and then it would it drop the frame rate and things like that yeah. so everything had to be weirdly more calculated than we ever needed to do <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's, it's a nightmare on paper but yeah <laughs> oh, there's, there's a lot of time and energy to that you, you could see you know the way you guys have things aligned you know i wanted to, to go back as far as like you know, the influencing, like the game does not take itself seriously. That's what I love about it. Like it doesn't take itself seriously. And then you've got a lot of references. Like as you guys start to dive in, because one thing you learn about Chai, like he's just ridiculous. Like, and then I, I like like the characters would kind of like kind of pull him in and get him in, in place and say, hey, no, you're an idiot. You really don't have a plan. What are you doing? Kind of a thing. <laughs> so I guess my question is like, as you're diving into the over the topness, like was there any fear, Lord John, of like, Hey, we, maybe we pushing it too far. Like we're we're really going <laughs> over the top, ridiculous with this. Uh, there wasn't really any fear because that was again one of the one of the key points was like this is the setting is ridiculous and does not take itself <laughs> seriously. Uh, so we actually wanted to push for like what's the how far can we push it to to get ridiculous? And the only kind of rule that we had was like nothing can be really too mean spirited, you okay. know. Right. Just again, it's a game about having a good time. It's a game about having, having, having fun. Mm -hmm. Chai is like this kind of like lovable goofball in a sense, but mm -hmm. he's never really like 
super, super mean, or if he is, he's called out on it or something like that. So that's where we always kind of try to find like a nice balance. But in terms of the things that happened, like if you're talking about, yeah, you fight like a giant werewolf in like a money pit, you're getting like <laughs> a shot out of a cannon and like into like the cafeteria and stuff like that. We wanted these like, oh, that again, we're just, yeah, we're just thinking of these like situations where it's like, you couldn't do this in any, in any other game that isn't this and get away with it. Um, and yeah, but in a, in a way, like it, like I said, we work in a horror game, so it's very sort of grounded in a way. And so it took a while to ju- to get out of our shell of that. Once we did, I think we we got a good balance there. Yeah, you guys, you guys nailed it. It's absolutely hilarious. That cafeteria scene is absolutely hilarious. Yeah, yeah. So I know what you mean there. Oh, I want to go back to what Addict said and, and get really focused on that magic moment because I think you know, for us. You know, watching the developer direct. It's January twenty fifth. We're all looking at this stream. You know, the Lords are watching, and it's a great stream. You know, no got no doubt. But then, you know, you guys come up on the screen, and we're like, "What is this? Right? This looks amazing. This looks cool." So, I, I want the temperature of the studio at that time. Like, the decision for the shadow drop. Like, you know, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And and, and I I felt like, you know, I wanted to know like why that approach as opposed to the traditional maybe we show it earlier give them a trailer or or something like that like what ultimately i don't know if you had a play in that decision or the higher ups did but like what ultimately led to no let's do it here this is the right time uh so we actually did plan on having like a sort of tease for what the game was, Ooh. but like way, way in advance, like at the worst possible timing, like, <laughs> like, 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 like when, <laughs> like, the be- like the beginning of right when the coronavirus. <laughs> oh, <laughs> pandemic so, time. Oh. Yeah. So we were, we were planning to do something around there, but then that, you know, even like E3 was canceled that year and yeah. um, you know, we're okay. Okay. Let's, let's back off that for now. Right. Let's just sit on it and see what happens, you know? Wow. Um, and then as we get closer to release we knew that we knew that a we had something special we knew that anyone internally who played it one of the things they said or you know if someone saw someone playing and looking over the shoulder they're like hey i want to play that like now like i I don't (laughs) yeah yeah, i don't want to wait i want to play that like right like right now that looks really fun and then um we knew that because it was such a departure from our studio that maybe the first like the first jump might be like hey they're a horror studio making something not horror can they really pull it off? Mm-hmm. Um, there may be some a little bit trepidation there. And uh, but we again, we knew internally we had something that was very solid and we we're very confident in it. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of wanted this short marketing campaign at first, mm-hmm. um, thinking, you know, like sh- show it off being like and you can play it soon, like in a month or two months or something like that, like mm-hmm. very short. Um, and then we knew that our release date was about around that January period is okay. what we're kind of aiming for. Mm-hmm. We're getting closer to that and we're realizing there's not like a good sort of like event or something that we can kind of like stand out and really, mm-hmm. you know, showcase it without getting overpowered by something else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As well as in the holiday season, games are coming out, people are playing that, they're not paying attention to something that might come out the next year. Yeah. Um, so then this idea for the, or they were planning this Xbox Developers Direct. Yes. And we said, okay, well, we're launching about that same period. Mm-hmm. Um, let's basically announce it there and we didn't even know if we could do a same day launch originally right so we're kind of figuring if it's even possible on like the back end and stuff like that but uh it turns out it was Mm -hmm. and so we kind of said yeah we said let's try it here and i'll give credit where it's due it's like that was a marketing and and pr idea that they're like we can use this event to basically get everyone looking at this title for the first time and get them to play right away. Mm-hmm. Obviously from a developer perspective, you're nervous because it is so different than yes. a normal release cycle. So you're, even though you're super confident about the game and you're, and you, you're proud that it's kind of finally be out there and people are going to be able to play it. You don't know what's going to happen. So you are super nervous. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're in our studio freaking out. They're like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be cool. It's gonna, it's gonna, <laughs> people are going to see this. They're going to get excited about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's kind of like a sort of natural evolution as we got closer and saw like, okay, this is really the 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 best opportunity, it seems, to to launch the game. And, and quick follow-up before I open it up. Like, so... I understand exactly what you mean. That that it's still there's still got to be a little trepidation. Does do you feel like 
the fact that it uh, Hi-Fi Rush launched in Game Pass impacted the tra trajectory of the release in any way, as opposed to let's just say, hey, it's standard, it's available, but go pay thirty dollars for it. I mean, you, obviously, you can do it on PC stuff like that. But do you feel that the the Game Pass factor maybe instilled some confidence from the, from the marketing standpoint? I think that was absolutely part of it. Um, so that was a big thing that if we're launching to Xbox users and they can, most of them, I assume, are Game Pass subscribers um, or theoretical Game Pass subscribers. Um, the fact that we can put this game out there and say you can play it now, and if you have Game Pass, you, you it's basically a, a demo that you can try. You can get over that hurdle of like, hey, hey, I don't play rhythm games. This isn't for me but you give it that first hour or so and you're like, wait, no, this, I can play this. This is mm -hmm. for me. This is fun. And yep, the quality is there. <laughs> yeah. So that was, I think, essential to maybe the success that it had was because we got a lot of people who probably wouldn't have tried it out if they had to immediately mm -hmm. uh, pay for it. Um, but we did get those people to, to jump in, try it basically be ambassadors for it and talk about it with other people as well mm -hmm. and share the love in, in that sense. But, um, but yeah, uh, I think, yeah, game pass was definitely essential for, for how that strategy worked and paid off. Wow. Impressive. Impressive. I agree. King, any thoughts? On well, that? Game pass? you already know, I bleed. <laughs> I, knew um, <laughs> I knew this was coming. So, so <laughs> we, and what I say, over the green side um <laughs> we we watch shows differently and what we always ask for you know what all attic always asks for is that um that moment where microsoft shows that theatrics cock, shows the cock, flair yes, that. yes cock, I that. all right yeah, yeah you, you too cock you cock acts was it yes. and all right so we're watching the show and tango games comes up and we're like well, what the hell we didn't know all we knew was it's supposed to be forza minecraft mm -hmm. and 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 um redfall. redfall yeah so what the hell is going on mm -hmm. and then y'all come out <laughs> then we see this game and we don't watch with our wallets because, you know, we pay for Game Pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the game drops and they say right now, I really wanted to get off air so yeah, bad. Yeah, we want to we, we we continue street. the street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there not looking. We're looking at like, okay, let me, can I download it? How do you spell it? Is it high with the hyphen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> on our live reaction. You I can can't. hear him saying that. Yeah, I'm like, I can't yeah. find it. I want to download this now. Is it on the regular <laughs> we, Literally, John, ignoring our live audience. And we're trying to get <laughs> down. <downloading it. laughs> so... You got like then, you got then people I in the chat. The I was gonna say you got people in the chat able to download it, and God's like, "Well, how'd you do it? Well, I found it." But anyway, continue. Oh, okay. Well, okay, so we know that you know you can get it in Game Pass, and like you said, for some people that want to try it out to get over that initial hurdle of do I play rhythm games or their studio that plays uh, makes horror games, to see the sales mm. yeah, of the yeah. game yeah. after the initial. Tell me how does that feel? Because you know you had 30 million plus people gonna try the game or going to have the potential to try the game. Mm -hmm. But to actually the purchasing, yeah. that that was a, a welcome surprise. How how did the team take it? How did you feel about it? Uh and I know you've been on a whirlwind tour, but <laughs> <laughs> how how do you feel about that that success level from that aspect? Well, we basically were looking at it from just like positive sentiment because that's what right. we're trying to just uh, at least gauge because we're seeing everyone play through the game at the same time and we're seeing them, everyone saying, I'll give it a try, I'll give it a try. And it's like, no, no, this is legit. This, mm -hmm. this game's legit. And then they just keep playing and no one knows how big the game is, how how anything, how, you know, what it leads to and everything like that they see like a low price point and they think it's like probably like a very short experience or something yeah. like that for those of you who played through it you probably know that oh yeah there's a lot of content in this game yeah there's a, a lot of content <laughs> yeah um and uh and i like i said we're just looking at more of the sentiment than anything so everything that we saw that we're coming out from people playing it were like the same things that you said the same things that our goals were we're about like the positive vibes, the positive, like the gameplay loop, the people like not in the genre, but uh, are able to enjoy it as well as like that throwback feel yeah. um, and sort of bringing back what it feels to just make like have like a fun game. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's like, was our big indicator of success was like hitting, hitting all of our goals as a developer and, and hitting those. And, and we saw that in all the comments and we actually surprised. We thought that some people might be put off by some of it. We're expecting some people to be like negative. Cause it like, wasn't, you know, a hard game or something yeah. like that. But it seemed like that was in, immediately like pushed to the side. It was like, everyone was so positive about the game that we were just almost like blown away. Cause yeah, it, it, it was risky from like a game development perspective, but it just felt like it, it paid off in that aspect. Yeah. No doubt. I agree. Eric, you have a follow up? Yeah. Uh, Cause I know we're coming up on the yeah. end of the yeah, show. I, I just got a, a couple questions that I can go through real fast here uh, mm-hmm. from, a, a, you know, our audience. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Hard I find says, will there be a box version for this if you guys are thinking about doing one? Like a physical uh, release? Is that on the plans in any way, shape, or form? We're we saw that there's a lot of requests for that. So we're thinking we're you know, we're we're looking into what that would be about, but we don't have any announcements for it. Yeah, that would be, we haven't decided yet. Hey, if you want to yeah. do it, hey, we, we'd be on for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> throw a little sound check. So on one, sold one. Yeah, yeah. Little collector's so, uh, edition would be nice too. I'm just saying, you, you don't got to say that. I, yeah, I'll I talk collect for statues. You. So, if we get a little, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, what up? Anything. You want to make an 808 chapter? So, yeah, a little statue. Yeah, Anthony, Anthony, Anthony versus anime. is there it? <laughs> Anthony said, Is there any hidden secret eggs that uh, secret Easter eggs that hasn't been found yet? to your knowledge people have been like finding a lot of the stuff we thought we wouldn't find so i don't know if everything has been found um there's some pretty like well-hidden stuff uh but i have to have to scour more the internet to see if everyone's found everything (laughs) i want to believe no i want to be no (laughs) and 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 then the last question by dragon yarvi um you know i'm going to reword it because uh if if someone like Netflix or something approached you guys to make a an animated version of this, would that be something that you would like to see? Not that I'm not asking. It's would you like to see this in an animated version? Oh, I think that's like the dopest idea ever. Woo! Like <laughs> heard that, Macari? <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. That, 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 that's all the questions that I could ask you quick because I know no, no. coming up. Attic, I am so because like kick this to me again screams like Saturday morning cartoon vibes. Yep anime style like i could see it like i'm already you know in my, my marketing I'm into, the, I'm into the toys and the statues yeah so like if, if, if you I'd, watch it, I'd watch it yeah yeah <laughs> like chaya 808 to me are already on the mount rushmore for mascots for xbox now like yeah, right? now it's a matter of you know what we could do with them kind of thing so yeah. no, salute salute to that man it, it's, it's been tremendous to see the success you know and again, the way you guys handle it, the development, you know, the, the, the just the attention to detail, fun, it's colorful, it's vibrant, you know, and it's just like this motley crew and they just get together to kind of form to be a group or be like a band, like literally like yeah. a band, like yeah. coming together like a band and stuff like that. I did want to ask uh, real quick, uh, I think so last, about the PC port policy. I don't know if you had anything to do with that though. Really outstanding, you know, outstanding PC port. When you had a hand on that, was there a separate team for that? Oh, no, we did that all internally. Um, mm. Granted, I'm not like a PC player, yeah. but like one of the, the baselines, we're like, this needs to be our best PC port. Mm. Um, even though it looks like it, it isn't an intensive game because of like the graphics, mm-hmm. uh, that's very deceiving because it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but our, I was like, people are going to assume that it, it probably doesn't need a lot of like power to run, even though it does. Mm. Um, so I said, we have to do the best that we can. So it runs like a hard 60 frames per second mm. on even like these low settings. Mm. Um, we want as much people to experience as possible. So uh, yeah, we worked really hard to optimize that thing. So um, it, w- it would be a good piece of support. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to and, the team. Sorry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Steam and the Steam reviews seem to show that because people seem to love it. So mm-hmm. that was our biggest concern. We, it's so hard to calculate. There's so many different configurations for PC stuff. Yeah. Um, you can only do so much, but uh, I think our team kind of like really just hit out of the park in that sense because it, it works great on a lot of PCs. So. Absolutely. Shout out to the entire team on that. The po- Just the overall polish of this game 
it's is crazy. tremendous. And and I, I really hope you guys get said our love to the teams because you know obviously you said the, the different platforms. You're talking about PC, all the configuration. You know, you're on the Series S, you're on the Series X. You know, and and that's one of the things that really stood out to me. Like, wow, not only does this game look good, plays good, the combat is amazing, the combo potential. I, I made like a whole parry build. You know, it, it, it so many things you could do it according to your playstyle. But the overall polish was one of the things that really stood out. So salute to you guys on that. And then um, yeah, like the final question that we ask all the the members of the realm that we got to ask Lord John is um kind of your top five video games or franchises of all time any order you know of all time oh my god <laughs> no, no pressure no pressure um, it's all the pressure oh wow okay uh i feel like it changes a lot but um as of today, as of today uh so i'm a huge fan of of Bloodborne on PS4. Ooh, okay. Okay. It's just a huge fan of like the environment there. Mm. Um Shadow of the Colossus. Ooh, okay. It's always a good one. I like the style. Um what you doing? Go talk. I want to say this because I I I, I know that you can answer to this, but I have so many hours clocked in Destiny 2. Oh, yes. You are welcome back <laughs> on the show yes. any time. My man, John, that's no, what I'm doing. No, no. what's, what's subclass, sir? What's subclass? What did you do? I, I'm, I'm a Titan. titan. I'm a All Titan. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to take no points away. All right, look, what, but... judgment free zone. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's judging. He's judging. <laughs> but it's okay. He plays Destiny. But no, yeah, but I had to actually stop because. Like I just was not getting any work done. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I need you I to finish these like, games, man. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. But I just the uh, Destiny by the amount of time played, I think oh, yeah. Destiny's got to be up there. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. yeah, that's three. That's three. Two more. All right. Oh my god. Um, Past, present, or anything that don't franchise that are important to you. Oh my god. It could be like old Super Nintendo games. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh i would say um i always go back and play castlevania symphony of the night Ooh, Ooh. solve would be going crazy right now oh yes. uh it's just I think like you're the classic. first one to ever say that too yeah classic. <laughs> mm -hmm. and i know it just came out as a remaster but i always love metroid prime oh um Good. It's just like great, like world building, immersion, things like that. Yeah. Nice. Um, good, great good top yeah. five. I love this. Good top five. Good top. Yeah. No, no. And the final one is King. Well, we can't ask him that last question. Let's leave oh, we can't. We can't. Ask him. No, no. You know why? I'm not gonna ask him that last question. Let's, let's leave the last question alone. No, but we gotta we gotta find out what his favorite console of all time. Is. Okay. All right. What's his favorite console of all time? I'm just curious. Uh, mine was the Dreamcast, yeah. Oh, oh see? <laughs> you was all okay, scared. All right, all right, all right, all right. No <laughs> doubt, salute, man. Look, man, Lord John, an absolute pleasure. John Johannes. I love Tango. being here, yeah. Oh, man, you killed it. An absolute pleasure. Incredible. Where can the five people find you? What else do you have going on? Let the people know, man, because this was an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. My name is literally my name. It's John <laughs> Johannes at John Johannes. <laughs> um, otherwise, please follow Hi-Fi Rush Twitter Ooh. account. Play it. Uh, if you if you don't have Game Pass, don't worry. It's only $30. Mm -hmm. Not a big barrier to entry. But even if it's up, you think it's not up your alley, mm -hmm. I say please give it a try. Yes. You're almost guaranteed to love it. Take it from these guys as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, we appreciate you, Lord Addy. Let's uh, any final words for Lord John on his way out? Yeah, you know, one thing I have to appreciate you, John, you and your team, like you kept the player in the center. You know, yes. when it comes to how the PC performed, to come to wanting to make sure the game performed well, when it comes to, you know, redirecting how you initially envisioned the game to make sure the player was always the center of the focus. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a say on here, it's like, you know, you make good games, you get rewarded. And I, oh, yeah. I think that everything that's happened to your game came with the hard work that you and your team done. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, core game play shine through. Lord King, any final words for the legendary John Johannes? John, um, you brought back a feeling that I didn't think uh, that I would get in video games for a while, right? My, the Dreamcast was probably the greatest launch in the history of video games. Woo! 15 must-have titles <laughs> at launch. Um, Jet Set Radio blew my mind. Mm -hmm. 
And um, when I saw this game, it just took me back to when games were just fun. Mm, preach. Just absolutely fun. And, and you're going through the worlds, you're finding things. And, and I play the game and I, I feel a little bit of Devil May Cry. Mm-hmm. I, I feel uh, the combo system. I, I feel uh, a lot of, you know, when you first play Sonic and you notice that the world was alive yes. too. It's It was just so many different things that I'm finding and I'm falling in love with the game as I go on and go further into the game. I replay levels just to check stuff that see if I got stuff. Um, I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you. And you were there to do a job in Japan and on a whim you filled out for another job. And, I love that story. And you was there and then you find like this purpose and his purpose was to bring joy. And I asked you the question about sales and you said, you know, it's not really about that. It was just about the vibe, the good energy given out. And I really, truly appreciate that. So that's why it's having so much success and I wish you so much more success. And I, I can't wait to see the hip hop version. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you influencing, you influencing the, hey, the hey, sequel? Hey, listen, hey, you, wait, you can't hey, wait, wait for a heartbreak, <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> Shoot your, you shoot your shot now. Okay, I see what you're doing. Okay. No, but I do appreciate everything that you guys have done, and um, I look forward to future endeavors. It was a fantastic uh, interview, and thank you so much for sharing your time. No, thank you. That was what you, everything you just said was exactly what we wanted to hear when we were making the game. So, thank you so much. Yeah. No doubt, an absolute pleasure. The legendary John Johannes, High Five Rush, one of the hottest. S- literally uh, secret drops in 2023 oh man what what more can we say look forward to hearing from you and the team looking forward to, to see what you guys got cooking and uh, again thank you so much for your time the legend and tango but that's the end of building salute thank you so much brother have a good one thank you peace